ethics and principles that support regenerative life processes, mimicking nature and supporting the thriving of local ecology. So I'm gonna go ahead and take you through just a few visual examples of permaculture sites, mostly in the United States, but some internationally. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and just see what you notice and what patterns stick out to you about these slides. Mm -hmm. So our first site is right here in Colorado, the Central Rocky Mountain Permaculture Institute. Um, this is their food forest. Uh, I know it might be a lot of green, but let's see if you get the idea there. Next slide, New Forest Farm in Wisconsin. This is a great aerial view of land management and a mature permaculture site on a much larger scale. Next slide, please. This is our limestone. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to tell you I had switched it. <laughs> oh, thank you. I think there was a slight delay, but we're good now. Uh, limestone permaculture farm in Australia. So take a look at those buildings, maybe noticing how the plants are arranged. Next slide. The grow house in Denver. This is an amazing community-driven organization. Um, what I really want to call out here is participation. Um, that's the number one ingredient that allows permaculture to work. It's up to us in co-creating with others. Next slide, please. 10th Acre Farm, Cincinnati, Ohio. This is a residential site, really thriving perennial habitat. Thank you, Amy. Next slide. Desert of Jordan, Jeff Lawton, um, really fascinating um, ability to cultivate in an arid setting. We're noticing massive desertification throughout the world. How do we co-create with the earth with a fraction of water that used to flow there? These are all great examples. And now I'm gonna to transition to Amy to talk a little bit about our next topic. And I'm also curious before we transition, if people just want to type it in the chat, just a word or two, any patterns you noticed between all of these sites, anything that stood out to you. And if you don't want to type it, just think about it for a moment. And I'm going to call out while, while people are typing this other definition of permaculture. Permaculture is a fertility cult. Um, I have never heard that, but thank you very much for sharing in the chat box. I love that definition. <laughs> so I'm seeing diversity groupings, human scale, complementary. I love these words because these are words that are gonna show up as we go through this, this conversation. But some of the things that you're calling out here are diversity of plants, um, smallish scale, human scale, harmony, the way things are interrelating. So thank you for doing that reflection here. Um, I'm gonna take a slight tangent and I promise this relates back to where we're going. Um, but before we get into anything, I just wanted to clarify these definitions of annual and perennial in case anybody doesn't know, nothing's going to make sense from here. An annual plant lives its whole life cycle out in a year. A lot of our vegetables are like this, sunflowers, um, some flowers that we grow. A perennial is a plant that lives for more than two years. Even if it dies back to the ground, it comes back the following year. So let's talk about ecosystems. In all ecosystems, there's disturbance. Could be flood, could be fire. Some of you might've been here for these events in Colorado. The first plant that comes back after disturbance, I bet a lot of you can guess what this is, weeds. Plants that we really don't like very much. Um, plants that are good at growing fast, taking up nutrients fast. But what happens in a natural ecosystem is these plants start slowly dying back and creating better soil and setting the stage for other plants to take hold. And a lot of times in our climate, that looks like perennial grass. It looks like forbs, flowering plants that are perennial um, that form this type of ecosystem. If there's enough water, they might progress here to something more forested, pine forest. And if there's even more water, they might progress to something that looks like this. And what all of this is, is called ecological succession. Now, the amazing thing about every single one of these ecosystems, except our colonizers, is they're relatively stable. Once it hits this climax community of species, 
These plants stay more or less the same. They're sequestering carbon, they're building habitat, they're improving soil fertility. Where do most of our food plants fit into this picture? Is the question I have for you. And feel free to answer in the chat box if you'd like. Right here. Over 90% of the food plants we rely on today are descended from weeds. What does that mean? It means that in order to keep them happy, we have to do this, right? That was the conclusion. Our vegetables are weeds. So are our grains, so are a lot of the things we grow. Um, and in order to keep that type of food system going, we have to constantly redisturb. We have to constantly bring an input. So this is kind of what's wrong with our food system. And that's gonna really lead us to the definition of permaculture. There's many definitions of permaculture, um, but one of them is that permaculture is a design science that uses nature as a model for creating resilient systems. How can we make our food systems and our gardens look more like nature? So that's what we're gonna start with here. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the lineage of permaculture. This way of living and being is also part of a way of life that most humans have practiced for centuries. Um, it is not new. I like to think of it as a summary and a collective of knowledge that is really zone and ecology specific. Bill Mollison coined the term in the 70s and kind of crafted it into what we define as permaculture nowadays and what comprises the curriculum, which is a series of ethics and principles that can be applied to any design site in any ecological zone. Um, but just really wanting to acknowledge this knowledge is not new. It isn't being brought to our awareness the first time. And that's a big piece of the social elements of permaculture is um, acknowledging and honoring the wisdom of generations past. So just a quick open discussion and please feel free to again, answer into the prompt or into the chat, excuse me. But what are nature's rules? Uh, we talked a little bit about mimicking nature in the application of permaculture, and you're all savvy pollinator lovers, so I'm curious of any rules that you see in nature. Um, an example here is that every organism produces something that another organism needs. Um, I'm curious about rules you may have that come to mind, and feel free to think about it. It's a pretty in-depth question. We have someone saying everything in nature decomposes, survival of the fittest. Nice. And there's really no wrong answer as well. Functions, Functions. in whole systems. Everything mm -hmm. is connected. Mm. Mm. Following nature's okay. pattern of sowing seeds. Every organism serves multiple purposes, forgiving. I like to think of cycles in nature and how those also apply to human life design. Can I switch to the next slide? Please? Yes. So this is a really fun graphic that we uncover in depth in the permaculture design course, the 12 permaculture principles. And in the middle, you see the three ethics. Um, you may recognize some of these in your own day-to-day -day practices or your own land management efforts, um, but they're all rooted in the ethics of care for the earth, fair share, people care. Um, so that's really an intersection of those elements. And at the heart of everything we do, we're considering these ethics. We're not going to go through all 12 of these, but we are going to unpack a few of them with some concrete examples. And as this comes up, uh, we're encouraging you to share your own experiences with these principles um, in your day to day. And it's a cool tie in too that I just want to highlight here that a lot of these things that you were writing down as nature's patterns, that's what these principles are. Basically, this is a code that says, how do you take nature's laws and turn them into human laws to design with? Um, and, and like Rachel said, we'll get into some examples here. I do just want to highlight too, before we move on, um, there's a lot of different ways that permaculture plays out 
With the rest of this presentation, we're going to really focus on how permaculture design can support pollinators um, at three different scales. And that's actually really central to permaculture is this concept of designing from pattern to detail. Start with the big, zoom into the small. So if we look at the things as humans that are hardest to change, climate is right up there. Um, we are succeeding in doing it, but maybe not in intentionally <laughs> as individuals. Um, all the way down to the things that are easiest to change, aesthetics, experience of place. Um, so if we look at design to support pollinators on the biggest scale, that's really going to start with an understanding of our climate. So another principle is to observe and interact. So what are a few observations that you all as residents of Colorado can make about our climate? Feel free to type it or think about it. Well, while you're thinking about it, I will add that the observation principle is the most ubiquitous element of permaculture design, is listening, understanding, and then going from there. Uh, we tend to have a prescriptive approach to problem solving in the modern day. And what really um, resonates with me in permaculture is that skill, um, which I feel many of you may already admire in your time in nature. And it looks some of like these... you do. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Richard. No, go ahead. I was going to say, um, we have some great observations here from people <laughs> yes. who have been observing. I'll just read a few of them here. Dry, semi-arid, windy, cycles seem to be changing, high altitude, intense sunlight. Basically, guys, Colorado is a really hard place to grow plants. Mm -hmm. Um, and as some of you might have noticed, the ecosystem that really thrives in Colorado without a lot of care is grassland. What's kind of interesting about grassland is the grasslands that we see today, even the ones that look intact, are vastly less supportive to pollinators than they used to be. And there is a very long backstory for that, but the simplest version is what happened when cattle replaced bison. First of all, bison have a really different impact on the landscape. And one of the reasons for that is they eat almost entirely grass. Cattle eat a lot of those flowering plants. What does that mean? It means that with a lot of cattle impact over time, those flowering plants start going away. But there's also the fact that the way people managed cattle in these areas led to overgrazing and desertification. And there's a really good graphic of this up here. The truth of the matter is, though, that the moister a landscape stays, the more it can support pollinators because it allows more flowering plants to thrive. Um, and one of the ways to keep a grassland looking abundant and vegetated is by what's called holistic grazing. So we could spend hours on this, but in a nutshell, um, you've probably have heard of the work of Alan Savory. What he did is he looked at grazing animals in their natural ecosystem. And he noticed that one of the main things driving the way that they grazed was predators. Predators were keeping the whole mob grouped up in a tight pack. Um, and then that herd was moving through the landscape very intensively, but very quickly. And that impact actually was regenerating grasslands. So when you look at a lot of farms in this area like Golden Hook um, that are raising cattle, that's what they're trying to mimic. They're trying to mimic this kind of dense, intensive livestock rotation that mimics what happens in a natural ecosystem. And what then happens is that these grasslands become vegetated with healthy soil. Um, they hold a lot more water and they support more um, pollinators. And I think the question of using bison to graze rather than cattle is an increasingly asked and growing one. And that would also change the way um, grasslands were functioning and supporting pollinators. But another great way to actually bring water in the landscape is to capture it there. And I'll let Rachel talk a little bit more about this. Absolutely. So water, the source of all life and growth, can be the most valuable resource, one some may argue, or a tremendous source of destruction. The way water is managed in our modern day um, is shifting. Who's seen the movie Damnation? You could just raise your hand or say it to yourself, um, very, very informative. Um, this image shows the 2013 floodplain um, in the Boulder area and shows the destructive elements of what we've been managing for decades now 
pave it, pipe it, and pollute it um, instead of what we like to employ in permaculture, especially with our ever-changing climate, slow it, sink it, and spread it. So those are kind of two opposing views of water management. Um, and there are many techniques for holding water in our landscapes. We also live with modern day bureaucracy and water rights. Um, so it's complicated, especially in the mountain west. Um, essentially though, there are big, big changes that you can make in your own site. Um, rainwater harvesting is actually legal, not illegal, but permitted in Colorado at a certain volume per household. Um, that you can actually use this to water your garden. Um, it's not supposed to be for beneficial use, but more on the ornamental side, which in our pollinator gardens, um, it, we're essentially encouraging biodiversity and a return of these pollinators who have, whose populations have diminished. Um, and part of that is water management. So these native perennial plants may thrive. Um, and, and just um, to highlight a little bit what's going on in this picture too, this is the 2013 flood. And the reason that flood happened is because we're doing this. We're paving, we're piping, we're trying to get water off the landscape. So this shift is how do we keep water on the landscape? And I really love the transition from this slide to the next one. Um, this is a site called Metacarbon Farm. Um, that's one of the sites designed by the, the nonprofit that I'm a part of. But what these are are called contour swales. And basically the idea with a swale is as water is coming down this hillside, right, off the mountain, instead of just running down the hill and eroding, you dig a depression. So as the water comes down, that depression is along the contour line, the level line of the hill, the water hits it, sinks in, spreads out, and then progresses down the landscape. Um, and you can see a picture of one of those being dug down here. In these contour swales, about 800 trees were planted bare root this spring. They were never once irrigated after the day they were planted. 91% of them are alive at the end of summer, which would not happen without this water harvesting. There's just an example there. Totally, so again, slowing it, spreading it, sinking it, giving it a chance to be taken up by the organic material, which will encourage biodiversity the longer it has to root in. Um, we'll get a little bit more into plants co-creating and guilds shortly. Here's another swale example at Boulder's Benevolence Orchard, um, a really a unique site, um, lots of sunlight here. And these swales now house a really thriving uh, fruit and flower garden. Um, it's quite enchanting if you've ever driven by um, next slide. Diverting water into a forest garden. Um, so this is a more like strategic and directed way. Um, water is always going to go downhill. Um, and there's other ways to reuse water. Um, we have so much that we just pollute and send down the drain, but there are so many possibilities with gray water. You can actually convert your laundry machine into passive irrigation. Um, you can use all kinds of really unique draining methodologies right at your own home. And instead of having that water go into a septic or into the sewer, it's going back into the landscape. So it gets a second chance. There's also wonderful ways to catch rain, uh, rain barrels, which in Colorado, you can legally have up to two 55 gallon rain barrels um, for watering and other ways, retention pools that do have a time limit, but can be beneficial across large surfaces. And one of my favorites as a gardener is encouraging more living and organic material in the landscape, either through the plants or feeding the soil that is feeding the plants, um, and ideally both. Which brings us into this question really of how do you turn your soil into a living sponge? There's a lot of answers to that, but I want to just ask this as a reflective question. Um, where does nature have a compost pile? And I think the answers to this I usually get from people are everywhere. The whole forest story is, an, is a compost pile. The answer I want to put out there, though, is nowhere. Where in nature do you see this huge pile of heap debris that's 20 feet tall and is emitting steam and is super hot? This kind of hot composting that we've gotten used to doing 
is not something you tend to find in nature. Um, and there's a lot of reasons as humans that we do it. Um, it kills weed seed, it kills a lot of pathogens, it's fast. But the way that nature composts is by this slow layering process of putting down carbon and nitrogen and leaves and birds sitting there and pooping. And slowly over many, many years that breaks down into topsoil in an organic way. Um, what's a little bit different about that is all the life that's involved. You think of the middle of a steaming compost pile, 160 degrees, there are no earthworms in there. There's no beetles. Um, so really, there are good reasons to hot compost in some times. Um, but one of the techniques that permaculture gives us is how do we mimic that forest understory effect? By basically using the layers of a compost pile stacked on top of each other, um, which is called lasagna mulching, in place to slowly break down um, and smother what's under them. And as a homeowner, I have to say, well, this isn't my property, this is a property I manage, um, but killing, the best way to get rid of lawn is this. Put down a layer of manure, in this case, cardboard, wood chips, densely, densely stacked, um, and within a year, with a little bit of extra water, that had broken down to a point where it's starting to build this crumbly rich topsoil and the grass is gone. Um, do you wanna add anything to that, Rachel? Um, just calling out the more broad scale way and uh, a real thing to keep in mind with permaculture in our modern day is we will not see these results instantly, but if you are attuned to the land inputs and what it needs, then you will see longer beneficial results um, in the big picture. So this sheet mulching or lasagna composting is a really prime example of that and a wonderful way to convert our lawn covered lands to biodiverse food forest or pollinator habitat. Um, and it's really powerful how quickly that works. But again, key input there is also water. Um, so it can be a little challenging to do this if you're not adding water. Um, I've had actually one of my trials and tribulations in permaculture was doing sheet mulching up in Netherland um, prior to winter and thinking it was secured down, but underestimating those winds and watching all of this hard work get whipped away only to have to start over in the spring. So that was um, an observation glitch. Um, and I will say it's okay to make mistakes. A principle we won't touch on too much today is to accept feedback and apply change to our interaction with our sites. Yeah, that's a very good point with wind um, and water. I will say I didn't water this particular setup very much. I planted mm. plants into it in spring with that dense layer of mulch. I watered them only five times the entire first year of their life and it stayed moist down there. So that's that again, if you can direct water onto your landscape and then turn it into a living sponge, the potential for water storage is amazing. Um, I suspect that a lot of you are plant people and gardeners. And so the whole next section of this presentation is gonna be focused on plants and designing plant polycultures. But before we do that, we just wanted to take a brief question break. And I know there have been some that have popped up here. So um, let's take about five minutes for questions now, and then we'll keep going into some more detailed plant stuff. Yes, and there's already a question, Amy, from Carmen. If we have suggestions for dealing with invasives when implementing permaculture and supporting pollinators, um, Tree of Heaven, which mm -hmm. is a tough example, I'd be happy to chat to this one. Uh, Tree of Heaven is originally from Asia and it's um, actually a medicinal plant, but here, if it is left unchecked, it will quickly turn, take over new sites or existing sites by sending very aggressive, um, shoots up and essentially hogging all of the nutrients and water and um, smothering anything else in the area. And I've seen some pretty mature stands of this in the Boulder area. And in the permaculture perspective, um, we can start with mechanical removal, which involves tearing out a really aggressive root system. And then the key here would then be to plant something that will take and not allow the tree of heaven to return, hopefully getting rid of all the suckers. Um, but essentially giving a native adapted plant 
the up advantage once removing it um, is one way. And that can be a process that needs repeated. Um, you also wanna be careful when selecting a cover crop that it too is not going to take over the world. Um, I think of comfrey in that example. It's a really wonderful plant to build organic material and plays a chemical role, but it can also become a major problem if left unchecked. Um, Amy, do you have anything to add to this Tree of Heaven example? Yeah, so two things, less for Tree of Heaven specifically and just for invasives in general. I'm gonna cycle us back all the way to that ecology screen. Actually, that's gonna be a lot of clicking, but you all remember it. <laughs> um, if you all remember the progression, invasive weeds are far, far on the colonizer species side of that. The best way, in to slowly start shifting these out of our system is to push our system into the next levels of succession. And what does that look like? It looks like changing the soil structure. The biggest difference between that colonizer species part of the spectrum and forest is the ratio of bacterial to fungal life in soil. Highly bacterial on the invader side, highly fungal on the forest side. The more we can add woody materials, to our soils, the more fungal they will become. The less we can disturb our soils, the more fungal they will become. So this is not an instant fix, but as a general rule, as we can start building layers and layers of undisturbed woody matter, invasives will naturally stop showing up. And I've seen that happening in my gardens, not instantly, but over two to three years. Um, I think that ties really well into this question of how do you keep bindweed from invading your lasagna mulch? Personally, I don't um, for two reasons. One, it's a better ground cover than nothing. If it's going crazy and competing with my plants, I pull it out. My pigs love it. For the record, bindweed is pigs' favorite food. Um, I did not know this until I had pigs of my own. They will root through a field, dig up every last bit of bindweed. So if you have a pig option, <laughs> use that first. But otherwise, putting it in the compost pile. Um, but I never plan to entirely eliminate bindweed from my system. And as long as there's enough other plant vegetation growing, I don't see it as a problem. It's kept in check. In places that are deeply come back and nothing else can survive, that's full of bindweed. Um, so a new question which popped up on the screen here, which is amazing. I didn't know that was possible. Um, <laughs> how? Do you suggest managing urban deer, which leave poop killing whatever grows? Mm. So I think there's two facets to this question. I have never noticed deer poop killing anything, um, unless it's extremely high density. I would be curious if you had a different experience, but usually that poop in a pelleted form like deer and a rabbit is not hot enough to actually kill a lot of plants. Um, unless it's in very high quantities. The question of dealing with deer in an urban setting is a whole other one um, or any setting at all. And honestly, I wish there were a better vegetation solution. People do plant corridors that direct deer off their property theoretically. Um, I think the best solution is to plant highly deer resistant plants and or put up a physical barrier that's at least eight feet tall or electric fencing. Um, Rachel, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. I was going to say fencing, and if you are planting natives and perennials, the deer are naturally going to be attracted to these because it's their food and they just see it as a free salad bar. So um, any kind of fencing, maybe with vine plants that are pollinator, I'm thinking honeysuckle, um, the deer might be into it, but the fence would still prevent them from getting closer. I mean, they'll eat everything. They'll eat bulbs, they'll eat veggies out of the garden. So it, the barrier might be your best chance of success um, if that's available. Unfortunately, they'll eat half of the plants that are listed as deer resistant on the major <laughs> websites as well. <laughs> um, if the deer eat Roundup tainted plants, would their poop kill your plants? That is a really interesting question. Um, my guess is if it were a high enough concentration, the answer would be yes. Um, but I'm not sure on that. I, I defer to somebody else if anybody has a scientific answer. I have not experimented. Um, 
And just a note too, to the person before that talking about putting bindweed in the compost pile. Um, I would not do that if it's gone to seed already. And I would let the bindweed dry out a little bit or put it on the surface of the pile just in case it is managing to reroute in a partially decomposed pile. Um, but otherwise you can totally use it or soak it in a tub of water for a day and then pour the whole thing on the compost pile. That's even better. Um, we did have another question from Karen about the best mulch for layering. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. thanks Thanks for having that. So I actually am really glad that you mentioned that. Um, and I think the answer is probably more complicated than we have time to go into, but two things in a nutshell, Gorilla hair mulch, which is the most common mulch that's around, is the worst. Um, it's a cedar industry byproduct from the West Coast. It doesn't belong in this ecosystem. It's antimicrobial, which means it doesn't feed the soil life. Um, it resists breaking down, which is why people like it. But for building fertility, that's dreadful. And it, and it is a mat. It keeps the water out. So just a really quick note, never use that if your goal is building fertility. Um, Otherwise, what I would do, and again, this is a complicated question, remember that ecological succession model, figure out where the plants you're trying to grow are in that model and use a mulch that matches that ecosystem. So if you're growing vegetables, use a grass mulch. If you're growing hardwoods, a hardwood mulch is gonna be best. If you're in that transition zone of shrubby stuff, you could use straw or you could use would, but you're trying to basically create the stage of succession you're trying to mimic. Um, and I think that's a very big discussion. <laughs> so happy to um, happy to talk about that maybe at the end if people are interested. Just to reiterate, the mulch that's not great is the gorilla hair mulch. I'll type that in. It's basically shredded cedar bark and it's very common. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we better keep moving here and we'll do another question break at the end. Yes, there was a question about gray water resources, which we'd be happy to share some of those at the end um, in link format. Oh yeah, good idea, Rachel. Colorado gray water, but I don't know the URL. I can send that right here. Awesome. So let's move on a little bit here to plants. Um, so a huge principle within permaculture is use and value diversity. And I'm sure that you all could echo a lot of reasons for that. I wanted to start with this example of plant diversity because I think a lot of you will be familiar with it. Three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. The tr traditional reason that people say this works, which you've probably heard, is that the corn is a living trellis for the beans. The beans climb up the corn. The beans provide nitrogen to the system because they're nitrogen fixers. So they're feeding the really heavy feeding corn. And then the squash is a living mulch that keeps everything cool and keeps the weed pressure down. That's all true, but also think about what's happening under the ground. Think of the root systems of these plants. Corn has a root system that's about a foot deep. Beans are shallow and fibrous, kind of in the middle zone. And then the squash has this spreading lateral root system. So what's happening under the ground is also non-competition. They're all in a different part of the soil. Um, and the other cool thing about these three plants is they're all different plant families. Um, corn is a grass, then we have a legume in the beans, and then a cucurbit for the squash. What's great about that is pests usually prefer to eat plants within the same families. So when you have different families checkered like this, you break up the pest buffet. So this is an example from, from vegetable gardening. But in permaculture, the building block of what we call a food forest is a guild. Um, and a fruit tree yield is basically exactly what we just saw, but now it's in a perennial ecosystem and it's much more diverse. So you can see these above ground niches really well here. You typically have a canopy tree, which could be a fruit tree or a nut tree. You have shrubs, you have ground covers. They're all positioned according to what sun requirements they have and what needs they have. But you're also looking to create diversity in a number of different ways. Um, and we'll go through some of these in detail here. So one of the ways that you're seeking diversity is through root systems. Does anyone, by the way, know how to delete this question from the screen? Mm. I've never seen that happen and it's cool, it's awesome. 
I'm just I, curious. I'm sorry, Amy. I don't know. And okay. it, you're in charge of the screen. So I, I don't know what to do, but it's really awesome that we learned something new about Zoom. Yeah, no, this is brilliant. I'll have to figure out how to do that in the future. <laughs> um, great. We'll, we'll just pretend it's not there. So kind of like the corn bean squash example, we can select different root systems when we're designing plants that are all going to be grouped together. And just a couple of examples here. This is horseradish, kind of a skimpy horseradish, um, but deep taproot system. Um, goutweed is actually a plant that's in the carrot family. That's The leaves are quite delicious, and you've probably seen this most growing as an ornamental, but it has that spreading lateral root system. And then another example of a root system type is tuberous, this Chinese artichoke, which is in the mint family. Um, bloom time. I especially think if we're working with pollinator design, choosing a diversity of bloom times is crucial. Um, and there's a lot of plants that we're probably familiar with that have a summer bloom time. So I'm not gonna go into those as much, but I did just wanna highlight a couple of examples of plants that have early and late bloom times that might fit in some plant systems. Um, I think mason bees are quite popular right now. Mason bees are only out for this very short window in early spring. So some of the plants that they've co-evolved with are these very early fruiting plants. Things like plums, cherries. This is our native golden currant, which smells amazing and is also an early bloomer. Um, and then down on the bottom here, some of our later bloomers that also have some edible use. These are called Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes. They're basically a sunflower with edible tubers um, and super easy to grow. And then on the left here, this is our native smooth aster, which is a nice addition. And I would invite people, if you want to add into the chat other examples of early and late plants you enjoy, that's great. Um, but just making sure we design our garden systems so that something is always blooming will support a much greater diversity of pollinators. Oh, it's gone. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> um, mm. The other thing to look at in designing these is certain plants have a special function in the system. And some of the really key functions include dynamic accumulation. Rachel mentioned this plant earlier called comfrey. Basically, comfrey has this really deep taproot and it gets down to levels of the soil other plants can't reach. Then it's mining those nutrients and they're coming up, they're ending up in the leaves. As the leaves drop, those nutrients become available to other plants in the system. So that's what we call a dynamic accumulator. And there are plants that actually mine particular nutrients from the soil that you can look up. But most taprooted plants are dynamic accumulators of some sort. Nitrogen fixation, these plants are able to take and convert atmospheric nitrogen through a partnership with root microbes um, and, and make that nitrogen available to the full system. A really nice local example is this sea buckthorn. This was one of the berries that Native Americans tended to use to make pemmican, um, their winter storage food. Really nice nitrogen fixer. It's related to Russian olive, but it's a native, great for the pollinators. Um, daffodils, as some of you might know, are poisonous, but what's really cool about daffodils is pest control, this niche they have that if you actually encircle an entire guild or garden with contiguous daffodil bulbs, tunneling animals like moles and voles aren't gonna go through that or eat through it because it's poisonous. So it's a literal barrier for pests. And then the last one I wanna highlight is this, which is fennel. Any plants in this carrot family form this big umble flower. And what's really great, especially with fruit production is you know those little worms that eat the apples? Um, the coddling moth worms or larvae, these wasps parasitize them. So when you plant carrot family plants under your fruit trees, it actually helps with the pest control for those coddling moths. And I had heard this for years. Last year, we had this brilliant fruit season. Um, I let wild carrots grow all over my vegetable garden, mostly out of neglect, but there were all these beautiful big white umble flowers right under my apple trees there was not a single hole on those apples. The ones on the other side of the property that didn't have that, full of holes. So it was a really interesting comparison to see that working. 
Um, and then the last thing I just wanna highlight is plant families. If you did nothing other than make sure that your gardens had a mix of different plant families, that would be the best way to ensure that you have diversity in your system because plant families tend to have similar bloom times, root systems, support similar pollinators. Um, and we could spend a lot of time on plant families, but just to highlight a few common ones in the culinary world, the cabbage family, brassicas, this is a perennial version of kale called sea kale, does really well in sandy soils. Um, mint family, we could choose a lot of plants from there. This is lovage from that carrot family. And then the rose family represents a lot of our fruits and early bloomers. So, oh, and then just highlighting again, choosing native fruits where we can will support native pollinators. Um, and I'm sure some of you are, are plant people and are already busy identifying these, but on the top, we have our golden currant. This is a service berry, which is kind of like the blueberry you can actually grow in Colorado. And then wild plums. And just to give you a really quick example of what that all looks like, this is a guild that I planted on my, my homestead property that you saw a picture of. And this shows you that full diversity of bloom time, plant family, root system, and all of these plants are really useful for, for humans in some way. And I think the best overlap here for us as homeowners is that these also look amazing. When you design these diverse polycultures, that actually looks really good to the eye too. And that's where we have a big overlap, I think, with, um, with what's possible in suburbia and with traditional landscaping. And then we showed you these swales earlier, but just an example of a mature food forest. That's those swales about four years later planted in this way with, a, with these plant polycultures. Rachel, I just talked for a long time. I'm sorry, did you wanna add anything? in there? I, I think the big takeaway, and someone pointed this out at the beginning with nature's laws, is that diversity is the key to success in these habitats. And um, I mean, how many monocrop GMO fields are just brimming with pollinators? I would wager very, very few. And the amount of land they cover has grown, yet in these pockets of really diverse um, guilds that are all serving functions within themselves. Um, the pollinators are encouraged to come and it's a whole system. Um, thinking about those sun chokes, once they go dormant and die, their flower heads remain as food for birds and the birds eat them, they poop out their waste, which is in turn fertilizing the ground to encourage new growth. So diversity encourages that succession to continue. And um, just by being a part of this organization, you're already making moves to encourage that in your own landscape. So I just wanna commend everyone for that. Um, and just to see what's possible in a not too long of a time span, four years from disturbance to food forest with benevolence. Great. Um... So let's see, I'm gonna breeze through some of this pretty quick because I know we're almost out of time here, but one of the really amazing techniques for supporting pollinators in a landscape is not just plant diversity, but creating edges, creating physical diversity in a space. And I think this herb spiral is a great example of how you can take what was a flat uniform form area, and now you've suddenly created all these pockets for different plants with different needs or Mediterranean plants that love sun and go drainage are at the top, um, and plants that maybe want shade and a lot of water at the bottom. So just the extent to which we can build microclimate into our systems will give us a lot more options. And I think an amazing local example of that that many of you have probably visited is this Jack's Solar Garden, which basically is saying, okay, these solar panels are creating a whole host of unique microclimates underneath them. Right underneath this, there's a spot where this is basically like a roof. It's channeling water into a little wet patch right at the base whenever it rains, and it's bone dry right underneath it. And these areas have more shade and this area has more sun. And all of that is in this relatively contained space that used to be uniform. We can now suddenly grow all sorts of different plants. And what's more, those plants are also keeping the solar panels cooler and moister and helping them generate more energy. So some really cool synchronicity if you haven't been there. 
our favorite Bill Mollison quote, we just had to put it in there. Mm -hmm. You don't have a snail problem, you have a duck deficiency. How can we reframe the problems that we're having into solutions? Um, and we could speak more to that, but I think I'll let Rachel here give you a brief intro to our course for those who are interested, and then we'll do our final question break here. Thank you, Amy. So that brings us to the 2022 Boulder Permaculture Design Course. Um, it's been really interesting and a fun challenge with our teacher cohort navigating COVID and meeting the interests of people who want to earn their permaculture design certificate. So for 2022, we've returned to our really popular and esteemed through the seasons course model. So it is an 80 hour um, overview. That's a once monthly meeting starting in April, the second weekend of each month where we will cover all of these principles and applications, as well as you will have the opportunity to create a design in a group to earn your certificate, which will be peer reviewed and extensively evaluated. Um, it's a really just powerful learning experience and you will get your hands dirty. For those of you wanting the practical, this is a very participatory hands-on course where your engagement makes the class. Um, so this year's course is mountains to the prairie and city to the farms. It will mostly occur in Boulder County. Uh, we have a really fun weekend camping retreat in there during the summer. And um, our early bird registration has ended, but uh, we still are open for registration and for being on no. this call. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Rachel. Go no. ahead. For being on this call, um, we're offering a little bit of support as well if you decide you would like to sign up and join us. Yeah, so we, there is a $100 discount on the class for, for being here. So feel free to email us to inquire about that. Um, I'll put the email address in the chat and we can answer more questions about this course at the end if there's time. Um, but I think Joyce, you had some announcements you wanted to make and then we'll have just a couple minutes for questions. I just wanted to jump back in for a moment to thank Amy and Rachel, really engaging discussion and some really practical advice. So thanks so much for that, um, so informative. And let uh, attendees today know that we're always interested in your feedback about our webinars and uh, takeaways that were important to you and ideas for future meaningful content. So we will be sending out a short survey at the end along with the link for the recording. And if you have been enjoying the PPAN webinar series, uh, please do consider donating to PPAN at peopleandpollinators.org so we can continue to provide this uh, great contact, content. And we will be coming up on one o'clock. So we understand that folks are gonna need to drop off at the end of the lunch hour but we're gonna stay on just a few extra moments uh, to answer any questions that might still be lingering. So um, stay or go and uh, thanks again for being here. So I think we had a few questions popping up and I'm trying to go back and find them. Did you catch any Rachel yes. as they came? Um, so programs available that provide seeds to implement natives, wonderful question. And I would direct you to a couple places. Um, one in the area is Harlequins. Um, they have a pretty robust system of seeds and seedlings for adapted plants. And there are some seed banks regionally. Um, Masa seed was pretty active for a while, although I'm not sure how much they're still distributing, but, um, if you check with your local municipality, a lot of resources. Um, I know here in Lyons, we have like a corner seed bank. Um, any other advice on that, Amy? I just highlight, I just typed this here, Western native seed I've used for a lot of like, especially the prairie, like turning sod into short grass prairie. They have an amazing native seed um, collection and they're relatively local. I've had a lot of luck with their stuff, so. Yeah, and Beauty Beyond Belief is another locally based one with lots of drought tolerant options and mixes. Yeah, and thanks those who are adding other 
other companies up there too, that's great. Did we have any other questions that I, I'm trying to go back? There was a question toward the end about lasagna over quack grass to keep it from coming through. Hmm. So if you make lasagna mulch thick enough and overlapped cardboard enough, it will keep virtually anything out. But if that really will require a lot of like dense cardboard with no gaps. So the way that I have usually lasagna mulched has kept quack grass out for the most part just over a large area, making sure the sheets actually overlap a few inches. But I know people who are more concerned about things coming through who will overlap the sheets and then put another sheet on top of the overlap and then put like a foot of mulch. And that does seem to be even more effective at keeping things out, um, even the more difficult ones that are more rhizomes and that, so. Someone asked what you think of pine needle mulch. Hmm. I think that pine needle mulch is brilliant for pathways. Um, it's great when you're planting pine ecosystem type plants. I tend to avoid it otherwise because it just takes a very long time for it to break down. So it's not improving the soil fertility as much as other types of mulch would be. Um, but if your aim is to actually just keep an area smothered out, no weeds, pathway, that sort of thing, it does work. Um, I know people are concerned with pine and acidity. I would not be concerned about that right where we are because our soil is so basic. <laughs> um, any acidity it can get is great. We had a question about nurseries that provide non-GMO um, plants and good ones. I will say Harlequin's Gardens, I might be biased because I worked there, but they are amazing. And they really are pretty much the only bioregional nursery that has a commitment to no neonics almost everything is completely organic. Um, in terms of actual like vegetables and plants, Aspen Moon Farm is amazing too. Will you be doing any courses in Denver in the future? Somebody would like to know. Oh yeah, so we personally won't, but there is a Denver permaculture course. Um, if you search Denver PDC on Google, you should find it. And theirs is great. I think they're doing a summer version. They often do a winter version too. And they have a social permaculture focused course as well that focuses more on the human structures that, that correspond to all of this. That's just about all the comments and look at us at 101. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much everybody for your participation and enthusiasm and it looks like I saw someone said see you in April so that is exciting where did that come and go I think Randy Randy oh, signed yeah. up for the PDC already we look really? forward to seeing you Randy <laughs> mm. thank you for coming today I will save the chat for you ladies mm -hmm. brilliant thank you thank okay. you all for coming thanks, thanks so much okay take care thank all you.